So we're going to start our afternoon session. Our topic, first topic for the afternoon is ways out conflicts and conflict solving strategies. I will go straight forward to our speaker, first speaker, Professor Peter Stone, UNESCO Chair in Cultural Property Protection and Peace at Newcastle University. He is also the president of Blue Shield International. Professor Stone has been working with military and humanitarian sectors since 2003 for the protection of cultural property in conflict. He has written extensively on this topic, including co-editing the destruction of cultural heritage in Iraq and editing cultural heritage ethics and the military. His article, The Four-Tier Approach, published in the British Army Review, was a stimulus for the establishment of the new Cultural Property Protection Unit in UK forces. Today, his topic is what heritage sites, targets in conflicts, and ambassadors for peace. Professor Stone, floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. It always makes me nervous when people clap before I've spoken um, as to, you don't know what I'm just about to say. Um, thank you to the organisers for A, organising this and B, inviting me. Thank you for letting me speak in English, which is the only language I could speak to you in. Um, and also just a warning, we are talking about conflict and peace. Um, there is one image that I'm going to show you which emphasises the context, uh, conflict bit of that, for which I apologise beforehand, but it drives home a point. So, um, the presentation there, that's the title, that's what I'm going to be talking about. And what? Are, yeah, oh, the, thank you. Um, we all know about the destruction of cultural heritage and world heritage sites. Um, we know about the Bamiyan Buddhas. We know about the bridge at Mostar. Um, and we know about the intention of the reconstruction of some of these. The debate about the Buddhas going on, the debate um, there from about Mostar um, showing the reconstructed bridge as a symbol of reconciliation, etc. But is rebuilding the bridge enough? We all know about Palmyra, and there are endless debates of which I'm sure you're um, involved and aware of about what to do with the image that is no longer there that you've got on your screen, um, the now destroyed Temple of Baal. Interesting, two of those sites were not World Heritage sites when they were blown up um, and were only inscribed after the event, which is an interesting nuance on the whole concept of world heritage and authenticity, which I'm going to gloss over. Um, so we all know the problems in terms of conflict. Let me just take you back a little bit to people who knew the problems of conflict even better than we do. Those people who had lived through two world wars in the last century. And essentially, the First World War was caused by the failure of royalty across Europe to avert the war. At the end of that war, the international community therefore got together to create the League of Nations. And the League of Nations, dramatically over simply, was there to produce um, peace through political and economic means. And that failed catastrophically with the advent of the Second World War. So the International Committee got together again, rethought the process, disbanded the League of Nations, but created the United Nations system, and in particular, UNESCO. And with UNESCO's image, and I'm not going to read everything out on the screen, but with um, since wars beginning the minds of men, as was written at the time, but most importantly, UNESCO took the whole agenda a major step forward by introducing humanity's moral and intellectual solidarity being a key element of everything that it did. So moving on from just the politics and economics of the League of Nations. 
And that was exemplified in the Nuremberg trials, where senior Nazis were prosecuted and convicted for crimes against cultural, um, in the language of the time, cultural property, okay, what we would today call heritage. It was there epitomized in Article 27 of access to um, uh, culture and heritage in uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It was also there, and most fascinatingly, and, and a discussion which framed nearly everything else on that slide, the um, 1948 Genocide Convention. And that was first drafted by a, a character called Raphael Lemkin, a Polish Jew who escaped Poland just in time. The rest of his family were all killed in the extermination camps. Um, but Lemkin had already started thinking about this concept, which he had to create the word genocide, in relation to the 1915 and 16 genocide of Armenians um, during the First World War. And then, of course, um, he worked in America, and everything brought central stage with the Holocaust. But Lemkin identified two forms of genocide, barbarism and vandalism. Barbarism, genocide against people. Vandalism, which frequently pre-determined um, barbarism. Vandalism, genocide against their cultural property or their heritage. And it was that genocide that would um, come before barbarism. In the final draft of the convention, vandalism was forced out by the so-called settler governments of Australia, the US, um, New Zealand, Canada, supported by ex-colonial powers like the UK, because they thought that it would be used against them and their treatment of indigenous communities. So it was there as what everybody wanted to see, but taken out because of that issue. It was there absolutely key in the development of the 1954 Hague Convention on the protection of cultural property in the event of armed conflict and both of its later protocols. And those who drafted the 54 Convention expected, and I quote, to create a red cross for cultural property, which they referred to as the blue and white shield. And if you see bottom left, um, why they called it the blue and white shield. Um, and that's what they expected to happen, a sister organization, because they all saw from living through those two world wars, the indivisibility of protection of people and the protection of their heritage. We all know this, I'm gonna run through this really quickly, but why is cultural property important? It provides the tangible and intangible link to the past. It gives people a sense of identity, a sense of place, a sense of dignity. But it also, of course, defines who people are, who belongs and who does not belong, who is included and who is excluded. And it is from that that conflict comes in many cases. It should be a key part of thinking, policy and practice of all what we call in Blue Shield the uniform, so not only the armed forces, but border, customs, police, other emergency services, humanitarian and heritage sectors. It is a fundamental plank of building in Blue Shield language healthy, peaceful, stable, sustainable communities. And that's the basis for the same level at society level. In 2003, when I first became involved in this, the International Committee of the Red Cross had lost that link that it was there in 1954 and were not interested. They only wanted to deal with protection of people. They didn't want to protect old things. Preparation is key, is absolutely fundamental. You cannot protect cultural property properly once a conflict has started. You have to do it in peacetime. I can give you good examples of that. I haven't got time to do that now. But you have to develop partnership and trust between those three um, points of that um, pyramid, humanitarian, heritage, and uniform sectors. They have to work together within the pyramid to deliver good cultural property protection. So the image that you don't want to see, but it is exemplified in this image from the village of Broko in former Yugoslavia during the fighting there. 
the um, protagonists um, took the population of the village about two miles away from the village to the side of a trench that they had just dug and machine gunned them into the trench. But the trench was then not refilled by the earth that had been taken out to build the trench or to dig the trench. It was filled up with the rubble of their mosque. And the mosque was destroyed, as an archaeologist I would say, down to natural, so there was no possibility of an archaeologist going in five days or 500 years' time to say, yes, there was a mosque here before. There was no evidence of the mosque at all, and they moved all of the material from the mosque and buried it together with the people. You cannot get a better example of the indivisibility of the protection of both people and their heritage. The Yazidi have, exactly, have suffered exactly the same fate at the hands of the so-called Islamic State. Um, most recently, the Ranga refugees in refugee camps outside Myanmar were asked what was the biggest contribution to their um, problems with mental health. 73% of them said it was the loss of their heritage, both tangible and intangible. 73%. This is something that is now beginning to attract and understand, as the um, quote at the bottom of that slide shows from Yves Dacor when we were in Geneva with him um, signing an MOU between the Blue Shield and the ICRC in 2020. You can't divide them. So, the Blue Shield, only 42 years late, it was created in 1996 as an international NGO under Dutch law um, and really only effectively um, organised since 2014. And it has um, sort of three elements, the founding four heritage organisations, ICOM, ICOMOS, IFLA and IFLA, ICA. Um, it has now 30 national committees globally with a th further 15 under preparation and together they establish an international board and with that board funded through my UNESCO chair as the other logo on there at Newcastle University um, uh, create the secretariat of the Blue Shield and Newcastle University is therefore the biggest um, financial contributor to the Blue Shield globally. Um, at the moment, which is a bizarre situation for one university to take that on. Let me turn to the other side of what I'm trying to talk about, peace. And um, UNESCO has global priorities, absolutely credible global priorities of Africa and gender equality. And it has, under its third strategic objective, the development of peaceful societies. It's not quite their forefront. UNESCO has six cultural conventions. If we had time, I'd make you guess um, how many of those actually mention UNESCO's primary function as established in 1945 for the creation of a global peace in, um, climate. Only one of them does. The 2005 Cultural Diversity Convention. It's only in Article 1 subparagraph C, and that's it, at the end of the sentence, and the culture of peace. And that's one of nine objectives. If we go to the 72 convention, I'm not going to go through the statistics there, but UNESCO's most successful convention doesn't mention the word peace in the convention at all. But my argument is there are potentially 1,154 ambassadors for peace in those World Heritage Sites. UNESCO's World Heritage Mission, again, I'm not going to read this out, you probably all know it, but again, there is the one word missing. That missing idea, there is no mention of peace in the nomination process, in the operational guidelines, in the management plans. Presentation and interpretation at sites is all about the history, archaeology, or natural environment that that site was inscribed for. So in terms of a site that I used to be um, chairman of, um, Hadrian's Wall, there are 11 sites along the wall that interpret the, the wall. They do so in terms of three things. 
the Roman Empire, the Roman frontier, and the Roman army. And the only way you can differentiate where you are in one of those 11 places is the balance of Roman army to Roman Empire at that particular place. Recording in there progress. Is very, very rarely a mention of UNESCO or peace or actually World Heritage at any World Heritage site. One glaring example, the now appallingly out of date um, kit World Heritage in Young Recording Hand, stopped. which had four chapters of focus, one of which was on a culture of peace. And that is desperately in need of revising and desperately in need of expanding in terms of the sustainable development goals, um, climate change, etc. But it's there and there's a little toehold in the process. So if I can paraphrase the next um, US president, what the World Heritage sites should be doing is not asking what UNESCO can do for them, but what they can do for UNESCO's primary goal and primary objective, peace. At Hadrian's Wall, I eventually persuaded one of those 11 places when they were redoing their um, exhibition at Tully House in Carlisle to include something called the Living Wall. And this is a wall that um, looks at um, boundaries, barriers, walls through time and across the world, starting with the Great Wall of China, um, the Berlin Wall, the so-called peace, peace Wall in Belfast, walls I'd never knew existed in Africa and others. And the question about all of those was, do these things ever deliver what the people who asked them to be built wanted them to do? And the exhibition doesn't answer that, but in the um, terminology of Freeman Tilden, the great interpreter, um, one of the things that interpretation should do is provoke people to think, and that's what we were trying to do. And without payment, we got at the end of the first week a response from one of those visitors. That to me is good interpretation. That to me was questioning world heritage and peace in the context of Hadrian's Wall. Every world heritage site could do that if they turn their mind to it. Every single one of them is my premise. We started this off pre-COVID in 2019. We did a desktop review um, of the documentation relating to all of the cultural um, and mixed world heritage sites, just over 800. And we've just finished one for the natural um, sites and mixed Recording sites. in progress. 160 of them referenced peace, but only within their attributes and statements of significance. Only 16 of the 1154 specifically acknowledged UNESCO's founding objectives. Six of these were in the UK, and when I questioned that, they said, Pete, you have been going on about this in the UK for the last decade. Are you surprised? You should be really brassed off that only six of them um, have heard the message. We pushed this forward post-COVID with a research project interviewing 16 out of the 33 World Heritage Sites, asking them what they did, what was stopping them doing anything more, and what might help them. Very few was, of them were doing anything in about progress. explicitly promoting peace. Several were talking about things like interchanges between different cultures. But there was a general interest in thinking about and um, sorting out what they might do. But the barriers were really interesting. There was no clear obligation or policy guidance to mention UNESCO and or peace in any of the presentation Recording or interpretation stopped. at sites. They didn't really understand what the promotion of peace meant. There was no good examples. They didn't know what the benefit of pushing UNESCO or World Heritage um, or peace would be to them, to their site. And there was a lack of resources and some much more pressing priorities. So we are now in halfway through a project in the UK. 
um, at the beginning of the year, we had an initial workshop to go through those responses to think about what people might be able to do. We provided some support material that they can put on their websites, that we can put on um, leaflets to give away or temporary exhibitions. We are going through with those 16 sites a pilot project where they are looking at how they can, for their particular site, introduce the concept of peace. We're having a final workshop in March of next year, and all of this will be put together in a report and an academic publication. There are really good links across to a number of um, SDGs on this. I haven't got time to go through all of that. So my end question to you is, does World Heritage contribute to UNESCO's primary mission? And one I haven't put up there is, and if not, why not? And it, it's a pity that some of the people at the front aren't here at the moment. Could it to in the future? And will it? And, and the will it is to those of you who are in the room who have responsibility for World Heritage Sites for whatever reason in your day job. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Stone, to share with us your insights and experience uh, links, also observations you have with the Blue Shirt International and Newcastle. I'm sure there are certainly more to be done and more can be done to enhance the relevance of World Heritage with the peace mandate.